In a recent video, I took apart a disco light, and it was an old one that contained a halogen lamp. And the halogen lamp was run from this electronic transformer. And I thought, okay, let's uh, take a look at one of these, because I don't think I've taken one of these apart in a video before. And this is a very generic -y one, so it's, it's ideal. So let's get straight into the circuitry. I've taken some pictures, and the pictures look like this. This is where, if you want to play a lie at home, as David EEV blog says, here is the top of the circuit board, if you want to take a picture, and then here is the back of the circuit board, all flipped in reverse so everything matches, if you want to take a picture again. Let's explore. Components worthy of note. The incoming supply has a 1, amp, a one ohm fuse. Uh, I was going to say one ohm fuse. Let's call it what it, well, it is. It's kind of a fusible resistor. It limits in rush, but it is just one ohm. It then goes across to a bridge rectifier based on four discrete diodes. There is no smoothing. There are two transistors. There are a bridge of capacitors. Um, there's a little feedback core here, and then the main transformer here, which actually converts the mains voltage, the in the R case, 240 volts AC, down to... 12 volts AC approximately. Uh, other things worthy of note are this little blue component here, which is a DIAC. Okay, um, let's get into the schematic itself. So take a look at the schematic. The main supply comes in, it goes via that fuse, it goes to the discrete bridge rectifier, all the diodes pointing towards the positive rail and pointing away from the negative rail, it's the classic bridge rectifier. Noting that it isn't smooth, although there will be some smoothing effect. Oh, grubby fingerprints from uh, handling a transformer earlier. Uh, I should actually write the value of these in. Let me just remind myself the value of those by looking at them. 104, that's 100 nano. 100 nanofarad. 100 nanofarad. 400 volt. I just need to write that in one, but I wrote it in both. It doesn't really matter. So here's the principle of operation. This is the transformer, the, the main transformer that converts the, uh, the mains voltage to the low voltage. But by using a small transformer, they save a lot of weight, but it's really, they have to drive it up very high frequency. And these things operate at ridiculous frequencies. It doesn't say on it, but I would guess probably 30 kilohertz, 20, somewhere between 20 and 40 kilohertz. They operate at very high frequencies. And it's worth mentioning that they are very prone to jamming radios. I can remember installing my first one in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. Early 90s, I would say. It arrived in a job. It was really unusual. I, I opened it. Uh, but as soon as it was actually in and connected, all the radios in the vicinity just stopped working. They are incredibly noisy. This odd thing, I'll explain that later on. So what actually happens here is that when you power it up, um, initially it has to trigger. And it has to trigger on each half wave. This is actually a rectified main sine wave, so it's, it's a series of humps. And it triggers just coming into the start of each sine wave when it reaches the voltage at which, well, above 30 volts, because that's the point this uh, DIAC will trigger. So this capacitor here, I'm guessing, limits uh, the current to a portion through the track, through this 5.6 ohm resistor, and triggers this transistor on. And there's the circuitry is not the normal circuitry. It's got me perplexed here. I'll show you why afterwards. But uh, that provides a little pulse to this transistor. And that transistor starts conducting current flows via the... Uh, it'll, it'll either charge or discharge one of these capacitors alternately in each half. When this transistor turns on, it's effectively discharging this capacitor through that in inductor, the, the transformer. But it's also charging up this capacitor, so there's sort of double capacitance involved here. And this one turns on, it discharges this one and charges that one, so they're alternately charging and discharging. But current starts flowing through the main transformer, but it also flows through that dinky little transformer here, which has a single turn. That wire there is the single turn, and then it's got a couple of extra windings on it for the transistors. That induces current in that inductor, which then induces current in each of these little feedback uh, windings. Uh, 
In the case of this one, which is not to be turned on, because this one is turning on, the polarity is such that that will be driven off. That will effectively make this uh, base negative with respect to its emitter. But this one, because current is now flowing in this, uh, this starts going positive, uh, turning the base positive with respect to the emitter, and that causes a sort of avalanche effect that more current then starts flowing and it turns this transistor on fully. It turns it on until there's no more charge left in those capacitors, and then it starts turning off, and as soon as it starts turning off, uh, the this transistor starts turning on, and as soon as it does, and current starts flowing in the opposite direction, it turns this one hard off, uh, and then, basically speaking, the cycle repeats. And what you end up is this very odd waveform. The output is not just a continuous... It's not DC. This is these are just not suitable for driving LED lamps at all. They they can actually kill the LED lamps. But the output is this very. If you can imagine, these are almost circular. It's like a string of beads. Uh, for, at the start of each sine wave, there's a wee pause, and then it basically emulates. It follows through that sine wave with a series of spikes along the uh, the full sine wave, and this means because the current is being drawn fairly evenly across the full sine wave. The power factor of these is absolutely amazing. The current to voltage ratio is almost uh, unity. It's very odd. It achieves very good results from such simple circuitry. That also means you can dim these, because if you actually turn it on in the middle of the uh, sine wave, then it will just trigger in the middle of the sine wave and run to the, the end of the sine wave. Um, the... There's, I'm not totally getting this trigger circuitry though. I'll show you why. This is the more conventional circuitry I'd expect to see. And this makes sense because at the beginning of each uh, sine wave, as the voltage ramps up from zero, or each half wave, as the voltage ramps up from zero, current flows through this resistor, charges up that capacitor just like a dimmer, and then it's the timing is just set so it comes on very early in the, the start of the sine wave and then it fires that uh, pulse. When, when this diac reaches 30 volts, it suddenly conducts, current flows, triggers it, starts it running on that half wave. But as soon as it does turn on, this diode here shunts that capacitor every time this turns on. And that means that uh, this circuitry cannot re-trigger that transistor. Um, while it's actually the oscillator is actually running and they're alternating backwards and forwards because if it did, there's a risk that those, both transistors would be turned on at once and it would be a disaster. So that's this difference in the circuitry is just that trigger circuitry. But this one, yeah, I find a bit perplexing what this is doing. It makes it look as though it would be very susceptible to external glitches and spikes and noise coming through that capacitor and causing this to trigger again. And it is notable that these uh, power supplies were notable for blowing up. They tended to suffer thermal runaway. When they got hot, a transistor might start partially conducting when it did, then it would be partially on when the other one uh, turned on, and then even more current would flow through and you get thermal runaway. It would start bridging out and then you'd end up with a lot of current flowing with no current limit and it would tend to go bang. And they did go bang a lot. They also had issues with traditional inductive transformers in the same circuit. Uh, if you had some of the electronic transformers and some of the inductive transformers and you turned the light switch off at the end of the night um, and the lights all went off but the transformers turned off in the middle of a cycle, this would dump out quite a high voltage spike and that could actually potentially cause a breakdown of the uh, transistors and next time you turned the lights on, they'd go bang. These should have a thermal fuse. This one does not have a thermal fuse. It's very naughty. Um, RF noise. They generate tons of it. I, I told you about that when uh, they, when I turned it on for the first time. All the radios in the site I was working on just stopped working. They went silent. And then I turned the lights back off and all the radios came back on again. Uh, it's not great. These also require a minimum load because the feedback circuit is actually... Uh, requires this as an, a load to actually pass current through. So typically these would be rated between 20 to 60 watts, and if you went below 20, they wouldn't operate. And this means that if you try swapping to LED lamps, particularly if you've got a ceiling fixture with um, 
that originally had the halogen lamps and it has an electronic supply built into it, then you'll sometimes find that replacing LED lamps, they don't work unless you put at least one or two tungsten lamps in amongst them to provide that solid load. The output is very high frequency. If you use even LED lamps with uh, with the usual AC input or DC input, but low, vol uh, low voltage 12 volt ones, the high frequency can cause an issue with the diodes. It can cause heating of the diodes, but it can also, worse than that, this isn't 12 volts in the sense that it's a nice 12 volt sine wave. These peaks of the output waveform average out at 12 volts. They call it SELV equivalent, separated extra low voltage or safety extra low voltage, depending on the BS standard you look at, but equivalent because it's uh, the fact they say equivalent suggests there's a possibility that some of those spikes may actually exceed 50 volts, uh, which would push it slightly out with that uh, range. But it is very spiky. And if you've got an LED lamp that uh, has the bridge rectifier and then charges a capacitor, then this thing is going to charge that capacitor up to much, much more than 12 volts and it could grill the LEDs. They do have unusual uses when they're behaving. I have used one to drive neon tubes. By the output of them, I had the halogen lamp connected to it, but I also had a small transformer with a capacitor in the series that uh, was designed to drive cold cathode tubes. And because this is high frequency output, it kind of matched that transformer to degree. And I was actually, the capacitor was needed because otherwise it would want to try and possibly pass too much uh, current through that transformer. But it allowed me to drive a circuit or neon tube around that 50 watt halogen lamp from the same power supply, just using that to drive the primer of the high voltage transformer. Anything else worth saying about these other than the fact that they overheat and go bang, that they will never ever last as long as one of the traditional transformers? Let's talk about the weight, because the weight's on these. Uh, 736 grams, one pound nine ounce. 78 grams, two ounce. Pretty much a tenth of the weight. That saves money in shipping, it saves money in materials, it saves money in, well, it saves the weight in your, your, van it saves the weight above the ceiling there are advantages from the lightness perspective i like the way that they've put the quality control label over a lot of the ventilation holes effectively about 20 percent of the ventilation holes in that that's a bit naughty uh, but that's it the circuitry also bears a very strong resemblance to um, compact fluorescent lamps i'll have to take a compact fluorescent lamp driver apart it's more or less the same, except this would be an inductor uh, in series of the lamp, and sometimes just one capacitor. And then uh, they would have other little uh, tricks to actually provide the filament heating voltage, uh, I, the current either by just putting a capacitor across it uh, between the two ends, or a capacitor and a thermistor to actually give it a good boost at the beginning. But there we go. It's interesting. It's minimalistic. I doubt I'll be using this one. Uh, because I don't really have that many halogen lamps to drive. But um, yeah, interesting thing and well worth taking to bits.